Fools, if nature were to shrug or raise an eyebrow, then you should all be gone, says Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. I got the green, the plant life of Earth. As long as it lives, I cannot die. Paganism is often defined as being an earth-based or nature-worshipping religion. In addition, its polytheistic proclivity leverages on pre-Christian or non-Abrahamic mythologies and relationships with other than human beings. Do we find any of that in comic books? Let's explore in this episode pagan sensibilities in comics. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Puca and welcome to my symposium. I'm a PhD and a university lecturer and this is your online resource for the academic study of magic, esotericism, paganism and all things occult. In this episode we will go over a few pagan friendly elements found in comics, more specifically in the artistic works of Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman and Grant Morrison. It's not really going to be paganism in comics, but rather topics, features and characters that align with pagan sensibilities. I'm limiting what I'm covering to what is found in my source, but I really invite you guys to leave a comment letting me know what comic books do you know that either incorporate pagan themes or are particularly pagan friendly. It would be interesting to do further research on the topic to make more videos for you guys. So your input and feedback are always appreciated. As Kenneth Granholm explains, catering to pagan sensibilities has become a popular theme in comics since the 1980s. The element manifests, for instance, in a propensity towards nature-based themes and other the human beings or other the human persons as it is reported in the scholarly literature. Alan Moore's Saga of the Swamp Thing is a pioneer on the matter. In 1972, its character was originally portrayed as a scientist turned into a monster due to a scientific endeavor gone wrong, a common background story in comics. Then, when Moore started writing the series in 1984, he dramatically revealed that Swamp Thing was not really a la Holland, transformed into a plant, but rather a plant that thought it was Alan Holland. This plot twist was revealed in a dramatic fashion, when the Swamp Thing is shot and the doctor dissecting it finds to his astonishment that its organs are nothing more than crude non-fictional approximations of human ones. And we know that you cannot really kill a vegetable by shooting it through the head. So the Swamp Thing revives, exacts revenge and escapes going on to assume the role of protector of all plant life on the Earth, being in contact with all plant life through an astral plane-like dimension called the green, and gaining new powers such as being able to travel vast distances almost instantaneously by dissolving its body and regrowing it somewhere else. The notion of a living nature is a classic and widespread feature of occult philosophy and a prevalent one in paganism, which aligns with the monistic worldview presented in Moore's Saga of the Swamp Thing. Monism is different from monotheism, as the latter implies the belief in only one god who creates the manifested word, whereas the former entails the idea that everything is one, and that oneness of which we are all part, including plants, animals and objects, is in all of its forms living godness. Grant Morrison's Animal Man presents a similar theme. In its inception in 1965, Animal Man was a superhero who gained the power to emulate the abilities of different animals due to a contact with crash-landed aliens. Yet Morrison made drastic changes to the character and its story when they began writing the comic series in 1988. Now the story goes like that. 
in an entheogen assisted Native American vision quest, Animal Man comes to realize that his powers are the result of him being in contact with all animal life on Earth through the astral plane like the red. And it is through this contact that he can borrow the powers of different animals. In Animal Man's newfound affinity with the non-human animals, he becomes a strict vegetarian, starts increasingly working for animal liberation and ecological welfare, and eventually even starts to take on physical non-human characteristics when borrowing animal powers. A similar theme of animal liberation is found in Morrison and Frank Kiltley's WE3, which revolves around a trio of animals, a dog, a cat and a rabbit, who have been modified by the military to be super soldiers. Interesting that here, humans are the evil antagonists, as the military hunt the animals that try to escape. In the end, two of them manage to reach freedom as the rabbit sacrifices itself to save the other two. There are other occult themes in the series, as it portrays the transfiguration, even transmutation, of beings to a higher evolutionary state through technological means. Lastly, in Neil Gaiman's Sandman, we can see the creation of a non-Christian mythology with the introduction of the Endless, a family of eternal principles manifested in personified form. Destiny, death, dream, destruction, despair, desire and delirium, who first manifested as delight. As Granon points out, even though the series engages heavily in existing mythology, including Christian mythology, the endless embody principles that are more ancient and fundamental in the fabric of reality than gods and other supernatural beings. Another element that we find often both in shamanism and in paganism is the importance given to the dream world, and more specifically to dreams as creative and or exploratory experiences in one's life. An interesting story portraying the power of dreams in comics is the self-contained A Dream of a Thousand Cats in the Sandman series. In the story, a cat meets Sandman in the form of a black cat, noting that dream appears in the form expected by the dreamer, and tells the cat the story of how humans used to be the pets of cats in the past, and minuscule compared to them. Then they, human beings, collectively dreamed themselves as the rulers of Earth, and thus changed reality to always having been so. The cats meet in groups, discuss, and the story ends with one cat sleeping and in his sleep hunting something implying that the cats are now dreaming a new reality into existence. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive summary of pagan or pagan-friendly elements in comic books, and can be seen more as an appetizer, covering a few themes in comics that opened the narrative to different worldviews that seem to be in line with a pagan and perhaps even occult perception of the world. But do let me know in the comments what other comic books or comic stories entailing or portraying pagan elements or even paganism you'd like to see next on this channel. This is it for today's video. If you like my content and want me to keep the academic fun going, please consider supporting my work with a one-off PayPal donation by joining the memberships or my inner symposium on Patreon, where you will get access to our Discord server, monthly lectures and lots of other perks depending on your chosen tier. And if you did like this video, don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, activate the notification bell so that you will never miss a new upload from me, and as always, stay tuned for all the academic fun. Bye for now.